Sup, you beautiful bastards. Welcome back to the Philip DeFranco Show, your daily dive into the news. And we got a lot of news to talk about today, so let's just jump into it. Starting with, this is the craziest story you're going to hear today. Right, so there's this woman in South Korea that thinks she's just giving some English lessons to a ninth grader. And so she coordinates with the mother on an app that connects parents with tutors. And the kid shows up at her home ready to learn. Then that kid pulls out a knife and stabs the tutor to death right there. And that kid, as it turns out, not a kid. It was a 23-year-old woman. And this crime was three months in the making. With this woman allegedly posing as a mother online, then discussing disguising herself as a student wearing a school uniform in person. And then after killing the tutor, this woman dismembered her victim, stuffing some of the body parts in a suitcase, hopping in a taxi and dumping them in the woods. And honestly, she might've gotten away with it if the driver hadn't gotten suspicious because yeah, it's not every day you watch someone nonchalantly stroll into the wilderness holding a suitcase. So they alert the cops who arrest the woman, get her to confess and charge her with murder. And what makes this all extra horrifying is the police say that the motive for this murder is that this woman was a true crime fanatic and she just got curious to see what murdering someone would feel like. And specifically saying she she became obsessed with murder from TV shows and books and saying it drove her desire to really kill someone. And as for the answer to her question, what is it like to murder? She reportedly said she felt remorse, which in no way should redeem this scumbag in anyone's eyes. Right? I wonder how a lot of things would make me feel, but then I don't do it because I'm not a monster. And then if you think that you're having a bad day right now, you uttered the words, this is the worst. I got a guarantee like 98% of you, your day doesn't hold a candle to what just happened to my guy, Carl. Because Carl's just an 81 year old guy mowing his lawn one fine Oklahoma morning. Morning, when all of a sudden his ear catches a faint buzzing. Just a little buzz though, not enough to concern him. You know, he starts walking towards his porch to grab some insect repellent. But then the source of that noise moves in so much faster than he expected, so he makes a run for it, but instead trips and falls to the ground. And with that, hearing a snap, looking down, seeing blood seeping through his pants, which confirmed, hey, he broke some. But that ended up being the least of his worries because a massive swarm of hundreds of aggravated bees descended on him. With them reportedly being Africanized bees doing God fucking knows what in central Oklahoma, and these guys were aggressive. You got Carl swatting at them, but he can't kill him fast fast enough, and they overwhelm him, covering what feels to be every inch of his body, crawling through his hair, up his nose, in his ears, eyes, and mouth. I crunched them, and then they didn't come out, and so I blew, some of them came out, then I stuck my finger in my nose and pulled them out. When he, while he's so covered, his eye flooding with tears, he literally can't see his phone to put in his passcode. But he still tries, swatting at the bees with one hand, swiping the screen frantically with the other, but he gets it wrong too many times and the phone locks him out for an hour. And unfortunately, Carl doesn't know you can reach 911 without entering in the passcode, so he just gives up. And he's just stuck there. He can't crawl away because any movement shoots agonizing pain throughout his body. So he hunkers down. He puts his hat as far down over his face as he can. He stuffs a napkin from his back pocket into his ears. He then draws his gun, not to shoot the bees, but he covers his eyes with the holster and he fires into the air three times, which is a common distress signal. But nobody comes, and so out of ideas, he just prays. Until one in the afternoon, three hours after the attack began, Carl's prayers were answered, with him going from one of the unluckiest sons of bitches I've ever heard of to one of the luckiest. Because not only did these two workers at a machinery company just pass by his home on their way back from lunch and spot him in the grass, one of those guys happened to keep bees in his spare time. So this angel of a human being runs back to his pickup, grabs a bee suit, and puts the mask on Carl's face to protect him. First responders then getting on the scene, fending off the bees with a water hose, and taking Carl to a nearby hospital though it doesn't end there because the doctors know he needs hip surgery. But first, they have to get a team of techs and nurses all together, tweezers in hand, to pluck out what has to be over a hundred stingers out of the guy. One by one. With Carl miraculously surviving all this and expressing gratitude to his saviors in this incredibly emotional video. Dear, dear Lord, I'm going to try to make it, but I don't, th I don't think I can without you. Also, I gotta say, while looking into this, uh, not to diminish anything with Carl, because Carl just lived through a nightmare, but I found out there's this other 81-year-old guy, Thomas Mizzle out of Texas. A few years ago, this guy got stung roughly 1,000 times by bees, which is why for me, I, I think the main lesson I learned here is either bees are less deadly than I thought, or just fucking old dudes are made of something I am not. And then you've got Andrew Tate versus the BBC raging right now. That's because Tate was interviewed by the BBC last week, an organization he now calls an extremist news outlet. And in that, among other things, he was asked about the investigation into him in Romania, where he denied the rape and human trafficking allegations levied against him. Though in this, there's been a lot of focus on how he spent most of the interview challenging anchor Lucy Williamson. Where among other things, he accused her of lying and making up quotes in order to make him look bad. You have said, my job was to meet a girl, go on a few dates, sleep with her, get her to fall in love with me to the point where she'd do anything I say and then get her on webcam so we, we could become rich together. I don't think that's what I personally said. I think that's, that's exactly what no, you said that's, on your that's website. A, that's, no, I've never said that. that your I'm, website, your words. It's not my website. Yes, it is. No, it's not. Tate also denying that he's a bad or misogynistic influence on young men, refuting accusations that he says controversial things just for clicks online. I'm genuinely a good person. 
I believe my impact on the world is positive. I'm saying that these organizations and the BBC who are going to sit here and pretend that I am the face of damaging the youth is absolutely garbage. It's completely disingenuous. It makes you and money. The reason, in fact, I've seen thousands and thousands of comments and have endless emails from women Praising the, fact, worry you? praising the fact that their sons are listening to me. Does it not worry the you? The, fact that the things I'm saying. And after all this, you had Tate saying he wasn't happy with the piece and writing that they vilified him after begging for the interview. But I'm also then linking to a full version of the interview on Rumble, which is 40 minutes compared to the less than 10 minutes shared by the BBC. And in that version, you can see more of Tate pushing back against Williamson. And over the weekend, he also continued on this topic, claiming that they sent a list of questions in advance so they could do a fair and balanced piece, but they, quote, threw all of this away and attacked me instantly. An ambush, a hit job attempt. They attempted to sucker punch me. They failed. And uploading a video yesterday where you can continue to condemn the BBC and legacy media outlets at large, saying it's not him, it's actually them who are harming young men. So I feel like now that these people have proved themselves to be extremist and very damaging to the minds of young men, I have an obligation to not interact with them very much because I don't want them spreading their extremist propaganda. And as far as if Tate is open to doing another interview like this, he said, I no longer have any interest with interacting with the legacy media for free. My fee from this point onwards is $50,000 and a box of chocolates. And there, saying the fee will be donated to feeding children in war-torn countries and the chocolates are just for him. You know, following all this, there were, there were a lot of different reactions, but a lot of them slammed the BBC and you had people on all sides doing that. Because of course, Andrew Tate has fans, he has defenders, people who are publicly speaking up for him, but also you had people who don't support Tate condemning the outlet as well, saying, hey, why'd you give him this massive platform? With some people writing things like, why the hell is the BBC giving Andrew Tate a platform when he's on trial for rape, sex trafficking, and exploiting women? I can't imagine how survivors feel watching this. It's a slap in the face. As well as platforming him not only legitimizes his misogyny, but also trivializes how dangerous his message is. It also enables him and his cult following to further aggrandize his influence. The BBC should be embarrassed. Also, with one of those tweets, I do want to note that he is not on trial, right? He's still being investigated. He is currently being held on house arrest right now. But technically speaking, he is currently only suspected of the crimes and there have been no formal indictments yet. Though there, things could change because the, the timing here is very important. With the current timeline giving prosecutors until late June to charge him and send this thing to a trial. But as far as what's actually going to happen, we're going to have to wait to see. And in the meantime, I'd love to know your thoughts on those comments down below regarding this whole Andrew Tate versus the BBC situation. And then, in absolutely massive and possibly game-changing tech news, Apple announced the Apple Vision Pro today. And while it was kind of known Apple was working on some sort of VR, AR device, if you look online, nothing really could have prepared people for today's announcement. Right, because the headline here is it made Meta and Zuckerberg look like fucking children. Like, straight trash. I'm gonna link to a deeper dive down below, because honestly, this announcement deserves a, a video of its own. And there's gonna be no shortage of them from the likes of, like, I just and MKBHD, Linus Tech Tips. But with what we saw, yeah, it's a mixture of VR and AR. You have a fully 3D interface controlled with your hands, eyes, and voice. Well, obviously there are gonna be a lot of custom apps for this. You can use old apps just in a different space. You've got built-in speakers. It's got a lot of different shapes, so it fits a lot of different faces. 3D knitted headband with cushion. You get more than a 4K display for each eye. If you wear glasses, there are optical inserts. They're saying the battery life's two hours right now. There's also this weird slash cool thing. It, feel, it feels more weird than cool, where you can use the cameras on the front to scan your face, and then when you take a FaceTime call, there's like an alternate version of you that the people see. Which also on that note, if someone's in the room with you, even though the, the glass is not transparent on the front, it will display on the front as if they can see your eyes. So the final thing, and this will make it a divisive device, they announced that the price will be $3,499 and it's gonna be coming out next year. Which yes, is a fuck ton of money. While Apple products are expensive, this feels very much like a, an early adopter's fee. I mean, I think this puts it around seven times more expensive than the MetaQuest 3. So this is a different sort of device. It doesn't make me less excited for what the future could be with it, but that obviously is gonna change this announcement for a number of people. That said, keep in mind what I'm talking about here, it's very surface level. I'm personally excited to see all the videos coming from my favorite tech creators. With, for example, I mentioned him earlier, MKBHD, even saying he's gonna try and put out a video or two tonight. So hopefully we have to see more, more questions are answered. But uh, for now, I gotta pass the question up to you. What are your thoughts here? One, in general, and two, uh, also including price into the equation. And then, did you know that two out of three guys will experience some form of male pattern baldness by the time that they're 35? Maybe you have that friend or that family member that's dealing with hair loss, and well, thanks to the sponsor of today's show, Keeps, you don't have to just sit around and wait for that to happen to you. Whether you're looking to prevent hair loss, stimulate hair growth, or just take better care of the hair that you have, Keeps has you covered. Keeps helps you stop hair loss before it's too late with a scientific and affordable approach to treatments that are up to 90% effective at reducing and stopping further hair loss. And in addition to clinically proven treatments, Keeps has an award-winning all-natural thickening shampoo and conditioner system. And you can get these products delivered directly to your door. That means no more going in person to the doctor's office for your prescription, saving you both valuable time and money. Hair loss stops with Keeps. So to get your special offer, just go to keeps.com slash DeFranco or just click that link in the description. That's keeps.com slash DeFranco. And then YouTube is changing. That 
is a constant when we're talking about YouTube, but specifically this most recent change is that YouTube is no longer going to remove some of the most harmful election misinformation. With the company announcing in a blog post, effective immediately, it will stop removing content that advances false claims that widespread fraud, errors, or glitches occurred in the 2020 and other past U.S. presidential elections. With that being a massive reversal of an election misinformation policy that was put in place back in December of 2020 amid claims from Trump and his allies that the election had been stolen. Claims that, in case you somehow forgot, literally helped incite a violent insurrection. But as far as why YouTube is doing this, they say uh, it's around concerns around the First Amendment. With YouTube saying, in the current environment, we find that while removing this content does curb some misinformation, it could also have the unintended effect of curtailing political speech without meaningfully reducing the risk of violence or other real-world harm. And very notably here, YouTube also arguing in the announcement, the ability to openly debate political ideas, even those that are controversial or based on disproven assumptions, is core to a functioning democratic society, especially in the midst of election season. But with AF people saying the idea that debating disproven assumptions is key to democracy is pretty fucking wild, especially as those disproven assumptions are still being used to literally undermine that democracy. So it wasn't surprising there were a lot of people shocked by this news, with this others also accusing YouTube of having a double standard, noting that the platform's still taking down similar false claims about past elections in other countries, including the 2021 German federal election as well as the Brazilian presidential elections in 2014, 18, and 22. But with that, like with any story that stood out to you today, I'd love to know your thoughts in those comments down below. And then, do you know how the Hollywood studios were potentially facing three strikes? Well, one of them's now not gonna happen, because the Directors Guild, the DGA, reached a tentative deal with the studios. And this notably is writers in the WGA are currently on strike, taking a stand against studios, and have emphasized that unity between the Hollywood unions is crucial in their fight. Especially since both the DGA and the Actors Union have negotiations of their own, and the Actors Guild even called for a strike authorization vote. And all that creating this potential wave of momentum against the studios. But then, late on Saturday night, leaders from the DGA said they secured a historic deal for directors. And the deal, including increases in wages and streaming residuals, as well as guardrails against the use of AI. So with this, you have people wondering, you know, does the DGA cutting a deal here undercut the wave of solidarity? And I mean, if you look online right now, it is easy to find writers that are pissed off. With one telling deadline, the WGA takes a stand, the DGA reaps the rewards. And others on Twitter having similar feelings, writing thrilled that the DGA was able to use the power of the WGA's labor action to secure a deal that works for them. And DGA sent us to war with a we're right behind you, then made a deal behind our backs. So for others, this news mainly just increased their frustration with the studios, which are represented in negotiations by a group called AMPTP. With some saying, as a DGA member, this deal looks great. As a WGA member, this deal is proof the AMPTP just doesn't respect writers. The fact that you can make a historic deal with people who can't even do their jobs until writers do theirs screams all you need to know about the AMPTP. So there you have some arguing that's not completely fair. The argument saying the director's deal doesn't quite translate into one that would work for writers because writers are fighting for a lot of issues that have nothing to do with directors or actors. And with that arguing that it's not productive for writers to pit themselves against directors, saying that's exactly what the studios would want, for unions to turn against one another, lessening their collective power. Though, I mean, I don't know. I, I, I look at this and I understand, if you're a writer, why you might be pissed. Right? I think there is a belief at some point a deal will be made. But the people who have been out there protesting for weeks are going to be the ones feeling the most pain. And then there were absolutely massive explosions heard in Washington, D.C. yesterday, but it wasn't what people expected. With U.S. officials having since confirmed that it was a sonic boom that came from two F-16 military jets flying at supersonic speed to intercept a private plane that had flown into restricted airspace. Now, reportedly, the plane's pilot was unresponsive and subsequently crashed near the George Washington National Forest, Virginia, with NORAD attempting to establish contact with the pilot until the aircraft crashed. And a big thing here is, as of recording, many details here are still unknown. But more and more information has been slowly coming out, with officials saying that the plane was a Cessna Citation, a business jet, and was flying to Long Island from a small airport in Tennessee, with the aircraft actually reaching New York, but instead of landing, it just turned around and flew over D.C. Virginia State Police have also said that emergency responders were able to reach the crash site last night after an hour's long search, though no survivors were located. And according to the Washington Post, FAA records show that the plane was registered to a Florida company called Encore Motors of Melbourne. The aircraft's owner telling the outlet that he had family members on the plane, including his daughter, his granddaughter, and her nanny. And very notably here, the FAA records reportedly showing that the plane had only recently been acquired by Encore. But again, this is still a developing situation and more will come out following federal investigations from various agencies. And then, you've got big changes coming to online advertising, specifically out of France. Because till this newest law, there weren't technically any restrictions on what influencers could shill or how they did it. But a huge bipartisan majority decided it's time to stop and passed a law that puts advertisements by content creators far more in line with the rest of the media. Also, since influencer can kind of be a vague term, the law tackles that by defining it. Individuals or legal entities who, for a fee, mobilize their notoriety with their audience to promote goods and services online, with it also applying to their managers if the deal exceeds a certain threshold. But also among the changes are things like no promoting cosmetic surgeries, products with nicotine, and subscriptions to sport forecasts. Additionally, you can promote gambling sites, but they have to restrict access to minors, and a very key thing, any promotional images must disclose whether they have been retouched or use filters. And all that in addition to rules that are just standard in French advertising, things like promotions containing food or soda also have to include bits about staying active. And easily, the biggest thing is if you fail to comply, if you are a French influencer, you could be slapped with a 300,000 euro fine and up to two years in prison. And, you know, this whole situation largely came about because out of the estimated 
150,000 French influencers, you had just a handful being absolutely ridiculous in what and how they were advertising. Even pushing things like flat out scams and the situation's just a textbook example of a bad apple ruins the bunch. And then, the war in Ukraine has been an unmitigated disaster for Russia. Right? Even if, and it's a big if, it wins. It'll have taken years and hundreds of thousands of dead or wounded Russians, instead of notably the handful of days they had planned for. But again, it is increasingly looking like things are just getting worse for Russia. With recently the war coming home with bombardments and incursions into their territory. And that's without mentioning the animosity between the mercenary group Wagner and the Russian army. A rivalry that has led to accusations from the leader of Wagner that the Russian army mined the roads out of Bakhmut in order to damage and maim his troops. And now most recently he captured and arrested a Russian brigade commander who allegedly ordered his troops to fire on Wagner. Meaning there's just open fighting between the two groups. And in a video on Wagner's telegram, this commander claims he was drunk when he gave the order and did so because he just dislikes the Wagner group. And what's shocking for many is that the leader of this group has been seemingly able to get away with not only openly bashing Russia's military leadership and even capturing an officer, but also reportedly working with Ukrainian intelligence. With there being two main trains of thought on why this could be. One is that he just became so influential with his de facto army that at least for the time being he's untouchable. Or it's that he's been given some free reign by Putin to do some of these things in order to pit his military leaders against one another. Which while it sounds weird is a strategy used by dictators to maintain power by ensuring no single person could challenge them. But amidst this chaos and unknown with the fog of war, I gotta say, a demoralized and less effective Russian military, that's a W. And that is where the news ends today, unless you missed the Sunday show where we talked about nine big stories that we didn't get to last week that we needed to talk about, as well as Zed blessing your faces with a special bonus video today. But no matter the case, my name's Philip DeFranco, you've just been filled in, I love yo faces, and I'll see you tomorrow.